So, so I will talk about the generalized gradient approximation today, but first I want to get through a few other points that, that I didn't, uh, I wasn't able to finish in the first lecture. Uh, so in, in uh, Kieran's lecture, he, he gave us a very nice explanation for why the local density approximation and related approximations, this includes the generalized gradient approximation as well, uh, is more accurate for an exchange and correlation together than for either one separately. And uh, I, I just wanted to point out that that's, that's, uh, that that's the reason why you never see anyone doing a practical calculation with exact exchange plus LDA correlation or exact exchange plus GGA correlation. Because that would be unbalanced. Uh, you would lose the error cancellation and uh, the uh, results would be worse than if you use the, uh, <clears throat> the same approximation for both exchange and correlation. Now, uh, I want to say something about spin density functional theory. Here I alluded to it in his talk when he talked about spin symmetry breaking and so on. But I should this works Try another one. There were four big ones in a bunch. maybe these these four? Okay, I'll try the black one. Whenever we develop approximations in density functional theory, <clears throat> and whenever we use the approximations, we typically use spin density functional theory. Uh, and the original, the original ideas came from uh, Cohen and Sham, 1965. They, they presented the idea, but they didn't really use it because they only had the big mirror correlation that was only for a spin on polarized electron gas. So. They couldn't, they really didn't have the inputs to do a local spin density process. Uh, and then it was developed more by uh, von Barth and Bedin. In the 1970s. <clears throat> 1972. The basic idea is that you can uh, you can prove the uh, hohenberg cohen theorem and the Cohen-Sham theorem for a more general set of external potentials. So uh, in uh, we've, what we've talked about so far, the external potential is simply a scalar function of position, and it's the same potential acting on spin up and spin down. That covers a lot of the systems we're interested in, in typical atoms and molecules. The external potential is spin independent. But we can't generalize this to spin-dependent potentials. So there can be one potential, one external potential seen by the upspin electrons and another seen by the downspin electrons. And then, as you might guess, the, the basic variable changes from the total density to the upspin density and the downspin density. So there are two basic variables, up and then down. The theorem goes, goes the same way. And up couples to be up and then down couples to be down. <clears throat> uh, now if, if, if V up equals V down, equals V of R, then these two theories, exact theories, become the same. Uh, so exact spin density function, exact spin density function becomes the same, and the energy gives the same energy, I should say. That doesn't give the same spin density, but it gives the same energy. So exact spin density functional theorem and exact density functional theory give the same energy. That would be the 
case, for instance, for an atom. An atom, the external potential is spin independent. So we should be able to do a, uh, a calculation with the spin densities or with the total density and get the same energy. And the fact that we don't is what's responsible for the spin symmetry breaking that Kiran talked about. Uh, when we stretch a bond, uh, like the bond in, in, in H2. Uh, but anyway, going with the spin density functional theory is, is a local spin density approximation. DXC LSDF, local spin density approximation, where the exchange correlation energy is a function of the up and down spin densities and is given by an integral over the three dimensional space, the electron density, and then an epsilon XC uniform. It depends on the up and down spin densities at the point R. And again, you can find the inputs from a uniform electron gas. But now it has a uniform upspin density and a different uniform downspin density. So we have to take the inputs from that calculation. The inputs were provided by von Barth and Dean in their RPA calculation and later by the quantum Monte Carlo calculations that, that I mentioned. So, so we can make this approximation, and when we do, uh, although this two, the exact spin density functional theory and the exact density functional theory should lead to the same energy, it doesn't necessarily it isn't necessarily so with approximations. And in fact, typically, typically we get better energies. So, so if a system is spin polarized, is or can be spin polarized in the ground state. with, uh, say, up and down spin potentials equal, external potentials equal. And typically, we're going to get a more accurate energy from LSDA than from, from LDA. So <clears throat> energies are more accurate than LDA. Example of that would be an open shell atom. Uh, it, uh, it can be constructed to have a net spin density. The end up and the end down densities can be different, even though the external potentials are independent of spin. Uh, and then if we evaluate the total energy using this, the up and down spin densities, including this LSDA exchange and correlation, we get a more accurate result. And this shows up, for instance, when you're evaluating the atomization energies of atoms. Here in cold is cheating because you evaluate usually the energy of the molecule. And since it's spin on polarized, it doesn't make any difference whether you do LSDA or GGA. But then when you evaluate the energy of the atom, you very specifically spin polarize it, and you uh, <coughs> and then you can calculate ac more accurate atomization energies for uh, molecules and solids. And of course, if you're if you're interested in solids, spin symmetry breaking doesn't occur in finite systems like molecules, but in in an infinite solid, it actually does occur. That's why we have ferromagnetism and antiferromagnetism and uh, other kinds of, of, of ter uh, ferromagnetism and ferroelectricity. Symmetries can break in in uh, in infinite uh, extended systems. And then uh, the, the local spin density approximation is often much better and more useful than the uh, LDN. So, so in my talk, in, my, in, my, in this talk and then in the next talk that I'll give tomorrow, uh, I will typically, to, to keep the notation simple, I'll just talk about the total density. And I'll write things as if we were doing a total density function. 
making a total density functional approximation, but in practice, there's always a spin polarized version that corresponds to using both, both these densities, which is constructed and used in practice. Uh, now, this, this actually gives us, a, there's a message here. And the message is that if you use more ingredients and more information in the functional, you can get more accurate results. So, so this suggests the strategy for um, to construct functions beyond LDA. That's the strategy I will follow in the next few lectures. First step is to add additional ingredients. the argument list of epsilon xc. For instance, we when we went from LDA to DGA, we, we went from a single argument, total density, to two arguments. There's more information in two arguments than in one, and that information can be used to produce more accurate uh, energies. <clears throat> and then the next step is one that we one that we talked about before, and that is to use these additional ingredients to satisfy more exact constraints. Formally exact properties that, that Mel has been deriving for us, uh, and also more appropriate norms. Word appropriate norms is a new word. We sort of introduced it into density functional theory, but it's a very old idea. The uh, LDA was based on the uniform electron gas, which is an appropriate norm for the construction of functionals. Because it's a density for which the functional can be exact, we don't generalize this idea of appropriate norms. So the appropriate norm for a given kind of functional is, it, is, is a, a density for which that functional can either be exact or highly accurate. Uh, so, so this is, for example, the uniform electron gas. We used to call that an exact constraint, now we call it an appropriate norm. Okay, so <clears throat> so this is the uh, this is, uh, this is what I call a tried and true method for constructing approximate density functionals. You add more exact, add more ingredients to the argument list of, of the integram, integram, and you use these in ingredients to satisfy more exact constraints or to fit more appropriate norms or both. And that leads to what uh, Carla Schmidt and I called the Jacobs Ladder of Density Functional Approximations. give a talk without showing the right? <laughs> so 
So a ladder has a discrete rung, and uh, whenever you add an ingredient, that's like adding another discrete rung to the ladder. So <clears throat> you draw a step ladder here. Space up there, and uh, with five rungs on it. Uh, now down here we have the, the ladder sits on the ground and this is this ground is the heart tree world in which EXC is zero. A terrible world, okay, but it's, it's a starting point. And uh, the first rung is the local density approximation or local spin density approximation, where the only ingredient that we use is N, really N up and N down. But I'll abbreviate that as N. The second rung is the generalized gradient approximation, or GDA, where we use the bent local density N at the point R, but we add the gradient of the density at the point R as a second ingredient. Uh, the, uh, and, and we can use that uh, second ingredient to satisfy some additional exact constraints, like recovery of the gradient expansion for slowly varying densities. Uh, then we have, uh, on the third rung, we have the meta GGA, where we keep these two ingredients, and we add a third one, which is the orbital kinetic energy density tau, which uh, is something that basically Kieran wrote down for us before. We take the occupied cone sham orbitals, phi i, well, uh, numbered from 1 up to n, and we take the, the gradients and then take the, the, take the square of the gradient, and if you integrate this kinetic energy density over all of R, you'll recover the cone sham non-interacting kinetic energy. There's a reason why this is the natural next ingredient and not the Laplacian under density, and the reason is that we can satisfy more exact constraints with tau than with but I'll show you that in, the, in my last lecture, uh, last pedagogical lecture. And then we have the uh, hybrid functionals, and maybe SIC, self-interaction corrected functionals, uh, where the added ingredient is the uh, cone sham one particle density matrix that Kieran briefly mentioned. Here I mentioned that you can use this density matrix to construct the exact exchange energy. And that's what you do in hybrids where you use just a fraction of the exact exchange energy, not 100% of it, but 25% of it typically. Uh, and uh, and the, 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 the final one up here is the RPA-like approximation, random phase approximation-like, where the added ingredients are the unoccupied orbitals and all orbital energies. So there you're really making use of everything that can come out of a cone sham calculation to construct the exchange correlation energy. Uh, and when you, when you get up the high enough, you should be close to the heaven of chemical accuracy. So here's heaven up. <laughs> Can I ask maybe a stupid question? I always wanted to ask you, why did you call it Jacob's ladder? Because the actual Jacob's fell on the ladder. It's because the actual... Jacob, he fell on the ladder. Yes. That was the <laughs> well, <laughs> I don't know if he fell. He, he dreamed of the ladder, right? He went to sleep and he dreamed of the ladder. Yeah, did he actually climb, try to climb the ladder? Yeah, that's called... <laughs> oh, okay. Yes. I didn't know that one. <laughs> that would be a little embarrassing. But <laughs> to get up too high, you can always fall. So, so the uh, the idea is that as you go up the ladder, the accuracy increases, hopefully, because you're taking account of more ingredients and more exact constraints. 
On the other hand, as you go down the ladder, the computational efficiency increases. Both those things are important. Which one is more important may depend a little bit on what kind of calculation you're doing. So somewhere on this ladder, you should be able to find a functional that optimally meets, meets your needs. <coughs> That's why we don't, we don't throw away the lower rungs. We keep the lower rungs because we might want to climb down again. We don't want to fall. We might want to climb down. Uh, OK. <clears throat> so uh, you mentioned the spin and the IE. Where yes. is it in the, on the efficiency? Oh, it's, this is the most efficient method. The, the, LDA, well, the LDA with that spin, I guess, is the most efficient method. But the LDA with spin is almost as efficient. And in fact, these three methods are almost comparably efficient. Uh, when you go, and these are the semi-local approximations, and these are the ones I'm going to talk about. Uh, in this lecture, I'll talk about the GGA, and in the next lecture, I'll talk about the better GGA. Uh, the increase in cost from LDA to GGA may be a factor of three. From GGA to meta GGA might be another factor of three, but not more than that. Typically. When you go up to higher levels, the cost starts to increase quite radically. In terms of you're evaluating exact exchange in a plain wave code, it's quite expensive. And you have to do the RPA, the cost goes up again very fast because you need to get all the unoccupied orbitals. So, <clears throat> so that's the idea. And, and, and in the end, what do we want to achieve? Does the accuracy increase likewise? Like yes, the accuracy like does increase. No way. So the trade, like the, the ratio of accuracy to the competition call, competitional cost is similar for all of them. Uh, well, it's hard to say. Uh, but rough, roughly, the, for, the, for the lower levels, I think that's true. Uh, for instance, when you go to L, LDA to GGA, you may reduce the error by about a factor of two. When you go from the GGA to meta GGA, maybe another factor of two. So roughly speaking, that's true. But uh, I wouldn't claim that there's a precise no, scale. And regarding the efficiency, how does the efficiency scale the system size as you go up the level? Uh, OK, yes. So, so uh, I think uh, the scaling with system size in, in, for most of these functionals is, is n cubed, the number of electrons cubed. So computation time. It was like NQ, or N is the number of electrons. And that, that's related to the fact that in Cohen-Sham calculation, you have to, you have to uh, diagonalize the matrix. And diagonalizing an N by N matrix is an NQ kind of operation. So you get to the RPA, it's actually a scale slower than that. So maybe N to the fourth and something like that. <clears throat> So this is for the first four rungs. The prefactors are different for these rungs. So it's, it's a constant time then Q. And the prefactors go up as you go up the ladder. So um, in the ADA, ADA is accurate if the density of the matrix is one. Is that true for, I mean, is that accuracy retained in the Yes, yes it is. Uh, so all of these, all of these functionals uh, should be designed so that if you have a, a uniform density, the functional goes back to LDA, and if you have a slowly varying density, it, it's uh, better than that. <clears throat> so, so what do we want to achieve? The, the aim is the aim of DFT. Let's, let's, let's say we want to get the right answer for the right reason. I'm stealing this from chemists. I'm going to add something to that phrase at the right cost, right? That's what we're aiming for. <clears throat> of course, you as a user, uh, or anyone who's a user, will determine what what actually is the right act level of accuracy and the right cost. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> uh, here, 
told me I should say something about the errors of LDA, and, and so maybe I should say something about that. And then we'll go on to GGA, which reduces some of those errors. So, <laughs> errors of, let's say, LSD. Typically, the magnitude of EXC is underestimated. Of course, it's exact for a uniform density, but for a non-uniform density, the magnitude of EXC is underestimated by the LSDA. But that's not so, so uh, important. The more important errors have to do with the description of bonding. So um, uh, binding energies too large binding energies of atoms to form molecules or solids. Too large by maybe 10 to 20 percent. Depends on the system. So it's a very rough estimate. And uh, we also want to, besides the binding energies, we also want to predict uh, bond lengths and lattice constants. Bond lengths are typically too short by maybe 2%. That's already pretty good. It's much, much better than the Hartree approximation where these errors can be 100% and these errors can be, can be 100% too. Uh, but it's not good enough if you really want to have a theory that's predictive, if you want to be able to predict new materials with new properties, you need a functional that's more accurate than LSGA. And uh, so that's where the GGA comes in. Generalized gradient approximation. It's the next rung on this ladder. And the idea for the GJ actually comes from Langworth and Mayo in 1983. The idea is to write EXC GGA as a functional of the, let's just write it as a functional of the total density, even though we really use the separate spin densities. So it's the integral over R, N of R, epsilon XC GGA is a function of N, and typically the magnitude of the gradient. And this function, uh, should uh, contain terms of, of all orders in delta n. It's a, uh, an expansion yields terms of all orders in delta n. So where does this idea come from? Well, it comes from very early work that was done, uh, uh, very early work on the gradient expansion of the exchange correlation energy for a slowly varying density. It was done by um, Brooker in 1968. So let's start, with, let's start with the gradient expansion. And uh, what they showed is, so this is after the, after the Cohn and Sham paper. People knew that the, there was an exchange correlation energy as a function of the density to approximate. And uh, Lon Brookner were many body people, and they 
they did a lot of hard work, and, and on the basis of that work, they did derive this gradient expansion. The first term of the gradient expansion is just the LDA, and it uses the uniform gas energy. And then the next term is a uh, the gradient term and this uh, this expansion is this is a coefficient that they could calculate approximately it has an exchange part that's independent of the density and the the correlation part that's uh, it's not, it does depend weakly on the density. And it's exact for slowly varying electro electron gas. To order LN squared. Okay, so, so the, the way that you derive this is basically through perturbation theory. It has to be many body perturbation theory, so it's a sophisticated calculation. But you start with a, a uniform electron gas and you apply to it an external potential which is weak and slowly varying. And then uh, and slowly varying means that the gradients of the potential are small and the gradients of the resulting density are small in the sense that I wrote down in my first lecture. Small compared to the uh, Fermi wave, wave vector and the Thomas Fermi screening wave vector. And, uh, and then you, uh, you, you treat that, uh, that external potential as a weak perturbation. You go to second order and the potential value the energy to second order and that potential. And you get the energy and the density to second order in that slowly varying external potential. And then you eliminate the external potential to, to restore everything so the energy is written in terms of the density. And then you get this result, the second order. And, uh, and um, this is... Uh, <coughs> This looks like a very promising systematic way to improve density functions, right? Because if, if, uh, if the uh, uh, LSD is the LSDA is the first term, and that's pretty good. Second term should be better, and then the, and, the, and then you could do even better by adding the fourth order terms and, and so on. Uh, unfortunately, it didn't work out that way because, and actually, Maude Brooker realized this themselves. Uh, this is actually a bad approximation for real systems that are built up from atoms because it makes the correlation energy positive. So for real systems built up from atoms, molecules, solids, and so on, uh, EXC, e, uh, EC, the, the, the correlation part of the second order gradient expansion, is greater than zero. And as Mel showed you, there's a very simple argument that tells you the correlation energy has to be negative, and it is negative in, in LSDA, in LDA, but it's not negative in this gradient expansion. And that's because the gradients of uh, the density in real systems are not small. They're not small compared to they're not very small compared to the uh, local Fermi wave vector and the local screening length. And as a result, the, the, the whole, the uh, exchange correlation hole density, NXC second order gradient expansion of R and R prime, violates two of the three exact sum rules that I wrote down before. I'll 
right down the ones that it violates. Uh, it violates the, the, the constraint that the exchange hold density should be negative everywhere. Or zero. It can give you regions of positive exchange hold density. And uh, it also violates the constraint that the correlation hold density has to integrate to zero. The gradient expansion of the exchange rule actually does integrate to zero, but that of the correlation rule doesn't. Now, why is that? What's the difference? Well, the key difference is the LSDA uh, whole, the exchange correlation whole, is based on the whole of a possible physical system, a uniform electron gas. So it's going to satisfy all of the whole constraints that uh, uh, the exact exchange correlation rule satisfies. The second order gradient expansion of the, of the whole density is not the whole density of any system. It's an expansion of the whole density to second order in the gradients. And so, uh, so it might be good somewhere, but it's not good anywhere. And in fact, if you look closely at it, you will see that the gradient terms improve the whole density close to the electron and they worsen it far away. So, gradient terms of GE2 improve the whole density close to the electron. That means for small values of absolute value of R prime minus R. But they worsen it compared to LSDA for large values. And so that's, that suggests a strategy for using the gradient expansion of the whole density where it's right, at small separations from the electron, and then cutting it off at long range to, uh, to satisfy the whole constraints. So the earliest GTAs were actually constructed that way. Starting from Gradient expansion to second order of the exchange hole density. Uh, keeping it for small r prime minus r. And then cutting off the long range part to zero. But in, in cutting, doing this cutting in a way that uh, restores the sum. That was the idea in the uh, Langreth and Mayo uh, GGA and in later ones that were constructed by my collaborators and me, including just a few of them. This is, and this is not a completely straightforward procedure, right? You have to make some choices about how to do it and you have to make uh, optimal use of the information you have. So anyway, the first one was Langreth and Mayo in 1983, and there was a Purdue and Long in 86. Then there was a Purdue and Long, Purdue and Long in 1991. And basically what happened in these three was that Langreth and Mayo started out doing everything in Fourier space, which is not a completely a clear way to do it. And then in, 
in uh, Purdue and while we were able to do the core, uh, uh, <coughs> able to do the exchange in cutoffs in real space, but we still had to do the correlation cutoffs a different way. And finally, in 1991, we did all the cutoffs as, as well as we could be done. Almost as well as could be done. And then the last one was the Purdue Burke and Ernzerhoff for PBE. Nineteen ninety-six. So this one came quite late, but it was done carefully, and it had an additional feature that the earlier earlier ones didn't have, which I'll tell you about in a minute. But basically, uh, what uh, this this is one approach. Okay, so this is the, this is the whole cutoff approach. There's another class of GGAs that were created by Axel Becca and by uh, Liang and Parr and others, which are take a slightly different approach. Uh, and uh, so this is uh, fitting, fitting, a, fitting empirical parameters. Typically only a few. And fitting them to atoms, not molecules. And so this is the approach that Axel Becker took in 1986 and 1988. And uh, Lee Yang and Parr. Uh, made a, a complementary correlation functional in 1988. And these functionals were typically a little better for chemistry than uh, chemistry applications, but not maybe not quite as good for solid state applications as the PP. Uh, mm -hmm. Didn't you just call that choosing appropriate norms? Yeah, 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 except Except that uh, I would qualify that uh, if you if you're applying this to a meta GGA, the atoms are appropriate norms because you can get very accurate uh, separate exchange energies and correlation energies for atoms from meta GGAs. You, you you do much better than than LDA for the atoms with GGAs as well, but I I don't think you I don't think you really need to do that for for the GGA. Because, as I said, you know, yeah, yeah. If you fit the atoms, you'll get a better result for molecules, but you get a slightly worse result for solids because the GGA is a limited form, right? That's that's the problem with it. It, it can't do everything ideally well at the same time. But yeah, that's not a bad. It's not bad to fit the atoms. It's not a bad, a bad strategy. John, forty-five minutes. Oh, forty-five minutes. Okay. Okay then. Please see if there's anything that has to be said right now. Maybe this is a good place to, to stop. So, uh, Yeah, okay, so I'll, I'll stop and take questions if you have any. First of all, thank you. Um, before I open the question, let me just say I quickly double check Genesis 28. No falling from the ladder. So uh, keep on climbing, you're safe. <laughs> uh, I'm relieved. <laughs> okay, now to more serious questions and comments. Who wants to start? Please. So, um, why can't you just keep on adding more and more of the Lipovskian and then higher orders of the gradient until you just until you uh, get a close enough approximation for most of the densities that you'll experience? Okay. Uh, you can you can uh, try that that approach and some and some have tried it. So uh, the third rung uh, meta GGA uh, in general has uh, you add you add two ingredients like the orbital kinetic energy density tau and the Laplacian. And you can decide which of those or both of them to use. In my work, I, I prefer to use only tau, and the reason is that I can satisfy more exact constraints with tau than I can with the Laplacian. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll make that clear in my next talk about meta-GGA, but just to give you an example, 
Uh, Kieran and Mel mentioned that the correlation energy of a one electron density should be, should be zero, exactly zero. I can use the orbital kinetic energy density tau plus n and del n in, in the right combination to tell me if I have a, a one electron density. Uh, and if I do, then I can, I can make the correlation energy exactly equal to zero. You can't really do that with Laplacian density. So there's some constraints that you can't satisfy with Laplacian that you can't satisfy with that. Uh, I guess what I'm asking is, are there more runs between uh, the meta, meta GGAs and then you have the hyperfunctionals? So are there more runs where you can keep on uh, adding more ingredients? Uh, you can you can uh, imagine doing that because the latter is a kind of you know it's it's somewhat arbitrary construction right so it reflects I think the actual history of of uh, of uh, functional construction but it doesn't it's not ex exhaustive it, it's not you know it's not the only way to do it in fact uh, you could you could go back and you could instead of starting instead of putting the GGA on the second rung you can put the meta GGA on the second rung where you only use n and tau. In fact, that has been proposed recently by, uh, by Luce and Giol, and it's, it's, in some ways, it's, it's a good idea. <clears throat> Does it have some of the problems that DGAs have? Uh, related to this question, so if you think about the gradient expansion, do you think about the Kirchner expansion or the Kirchner expansion, mm -hmm. you can show that if you sum up all the gradients, Second, four, six, eight, one, two parts. You get the exact kinetic energy of the monetary system for the exchange energy. But I was wondering, is that also formally shown for the correlation energy? Uh, if I had, had, I'm not sure if that's actually been shown. I know that there is there is, that you can make higher and higher order gradient expansions. And so for the so for the kinetic energy, I think people have actually gone up to sixth order. It's a sixth order gradient expansion for the kinetic energy. But I don't know if anyone has ever proved that the summation of that whole series gives you the exact kinetic energy for any density. You know, because you're starting, you're doing, a, you're doing an asymptotic expansion around the slowly growing density limit. Whether that asymptotic, the sum of that asymptotic expansion is the exact functional or not, I don't know if anybody knows the answer to that. But anyway, yeah, yeah, you can you can add higher order terms. And in fact, in the, in the meta GGA, we recover the fourth order gradient for ex expansion for exchange, which includes Laplacian terms, but we, we get it without the Laplacian. We get it from the kinetic energy density because that also has a gradient expansion that brings in Laplacians. <coughs> um, is there a reason why I think that the first order term has modulus? Like modulus of oh, yes, 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 there is. Uh, because we're starting out with a uniform density, which is uh, an iso isotropic system. The density is uniform, so every direction in the uniform density is equivalent to every other direction. So wh whether you make the density uh, uh, vary in, in this direction or that direction, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. Yeah, so it's just the... Yes. And the direction is still a direction. That's right. So would that be okay? Uh, it, it's, it doesn't come out of the derivation. So when you derive the gradient expansion, you find that it starts out at the second order, del n squared. Um, it's, okay. it's how it comes out. <laughs> Other questions? Yes, please. Uh, in some cases, it's always uh, it is that NDA gives a little bit of oxygen because it cancels out others. Can you? Yeah, uh, that's uh, that's uh, that depends somewhat on the GGA. Okay, so so if you look at the GGAs that I have listed here, uh, these are these are probably somewhat worse for solids than than LDA. Uh, these are maybe comparable overall, but there'll be some cases where these are also worse, because what typically happens when you add the GGA is that you overcorrect the bond length and instead of being 2% too short it becomes 2% too long or 1% too long but sometimes it's more than sometimes the error of the GGA is more than the error of the LDA. Uh, there are however the GGAs for solids which I didn't get to in this lecture but 
is a GGA for solids, two of them actually. There may be more by now, but there's the Armiento and Matson 05, and there's the PBE saw. These reflect a, a, a satisfying a different set of exact constraints from PBE. Uh, it, so they still constructed, well, at least PBE saw is constructed from some constraint satisfactions, but there's a choice in GGA about which constraints you can satisfy. That's part of the problem with GGA. It's too limited a form. Uh, the, these, these, these functionals typically are, are, I would say, almost always better for solids than uh, PBE is. Or at least comparable. You mentioned the of the LDA, and I didn't quite understand how does it affect the energetic and the excited states. Now, you told the it isn't very good for excited states, but still, the hormones corresponds to the ionization energy. This type of properties. Mm -hmm. Are they better uh, corrected by GGA and other functionals or less? Uh, yeah, so, so, so for instance, the ionization potential theorem that says that the highest occupied orbital energy of the exact home champ system is minus the ionization energy, uh, is not satisfied well by LDA. It may be slightly better satisfied, slightly better by GGA, but not very much, so it's not a significant uh, the asymptotic behavior of the potential is, is still wrong. And so, and so the orbital energies are still too high. So these are mainly corrected by hybrid and, uh, and higher steps on the level. Yes, that's right. <coughs> Other questions? All right. No further questions. Then this is the time to thank John again.